I'm John Carter in Moscow, in Havana, Cuba. Now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, right here in communist China, reporting from India. Hi, I'm John Carter in the Solomon Islands. I'm John Carter in Soweto, from El Salvador. I'm John Carter in Sydney, Australia. John Carter tells us how to survive the end times. Welcome back to How to Survive the End Times. We've been talking about the Great Tribulation and the elect. So this is just a follow-on from the last segment of the program. This is the second part. I'm going to give you right now seven great prophetic signs. I'm just going to give this to you. We're not going to turn up all the text because we don't have time. This is going to be a sort of a summary. Seven great prophetic signs. A brief summary. Number one, the gospel to the whole wide world. Jesus said, now we don't need to turn up all these texts. Jesus said, the gospel is going to be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations. Then the end is going to come. I've seen this prophecy being fulfilled. The most unlikely place for this prophecy to be fulfilled is China, where there will soon be more Christians than in the United States of America. The gospel to the world, sign number one. Sign number two, destroyers of the earth. And there's a text that most folks have never heard of. Revelation 11, verse 18. Uh, I've got lots of folks who say to me, I don't believe in destruction of the earth. I don't believe that man is destroying the earth. I say to those folks, apparently you just don't read your Bible. Because in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18 says that God is going to destroy those people who destroy the earth. Actually says this. And the Greek word for destroy has a couple of meanings. And one of those words is pollute the earth. And so before the end of time comes, mankind is going to destroy the earth and he's going to pollute the earth. This is a sign of the end. Number three is terrorism. Um, you know, this, this is the great text. He's going to destroy those that destroy. Here it is, yeah. Fear your name, and he shall destroy those who destroy the earth. But the next text, the next point I want to make is worldwide terrorism. I want us to see this now. Worldwide terrorism. And we've got a text here. It's Second Timothy chapter 3. And it talks, this, this is quite astounding. It talks about religious terrorism. Now, you go read it sometime. It talks about religious terrorism as a sign of the end. Sign number four, the collapse of traditional morality. Uh, Matthew 24 says that it's going to get so, so really bad in the last days that the world is going to become as it was in the days of Noah before the flood. And when the world got so stinking and so, so really bad, my friends, God sent a worldwide flood and took them all away. And in the book of Jude, it talks about the world becoming as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, where there would be, hey, this is terribly politically incorrect what I'm going to say, but people will become obsessed with perverted sex. This is a sign of the times. Remember what Jesus said, the flood came and took them all away. A sign number five is the rise and the rule of Antichrist, a pseudo-Christian power. Now you can go to most churches most of your life and you'll never hear these prophecies explained. It's an amazing thing. Even the people who profess to be the people of God no longer seem to preach these things. But in the, uh, the book of Daniel, it talks about the coming of a combination of of church and state, a pseudo-Christian power who will take peace from the earth. I believe that this power is on the earth today and he's doing his work today. Revelation 13 talks about the same thing, the rise of a pseudo-Christian power. Sign number six, spiritism and evil spirits. Next time we do a TV program here, I'm going to talk about... Um, the origin and the end of evil. 
I believe in a personal devil. I believe there's a being by the name of Satan or Satan, Lucifer. And in the book of Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 16, it talks about these awful demonic creatures that come up out of the bottomless pit. Most people read this, they've got no idea what it's talking about. It talks about these creatures that come up out of the bottomless bottomless pit and they're like scorpions. They've got a sting in their tail. It is an apocalyptic picture, portrayal of demonism that takes over the earth in the last days. I mean, without God, this is pretty scary stuff. Pretty scary stuff. Sign number seven. The United States raised up by the power of God to be a bastion of freedom. The last great superpower and the collapse of freedom. In Revelation chapter 13, it talks about a power that doesn't come up out of the sea representing the peoples of the earth, but it comes up in a new part of the world. And it comes up like a lamb representing the gospel. And the power ends up speaking like a dragon or the devil himself. A power that will take peace from the earth and bring about the union of church and state. Now many people today in the United States of America have never heard of what a theocracy is. And we've got millions of Americans today who say, in the name of God, we want Jesus to be the head of our nation. Hallelujah. Praise God. We want the union of church and state. We want Jesus. Well, I want Jesus too, but not the head of the government. Because once you get away from the great truth of the separation of church and state, You step back into the dark ages and in the dark ages, millions of people were put to death. And my friend, why is it that so many people in this great land of the United States of America have have lost their sense of identity? Don't they remember what America was raised up for? Don't they remember how America came into being? People escaped the persecutions of the old world. And they came to this country because they wanted a church without a pope and a state without a king. And the greatness of America was the separation of church and state so that everybody could worship or not worship according to the dictates of conscience. But the Bible says, This is going to change. This is the most politically incorrect sermon you're ever going to hear. I'm telling you. But I believe we're living in a time when church and state are going to join together and persecute those who think differently. That's one of the great signs. And the groundwork is being laid. The lamb that speaks is a dragon. Every person who is watching the telecast and everybody in our great little studio here in California knows about the bulletin of atomic scientists. You all know about this. These people are not believers. They're not students of the Bible. And when they look at the world and when they look at what's happening in the world and when they look at the proliferation of nuclear weapons, They have put the doomsday clock at two minutes to midnight. These are not raving preachers. These are not evangelists. These are, I was going to say, cold-blooded, at least cool-headed scientists. And they believe that the clock is now facing two minutes to midnight. And what is amazing to me and to many, many other people that in this time of tremendous peril, the church, the Christian church, seems to be completely asleep and is talking platitudes. And so I believe we've come to the end times 
and the great tribulation is about to burst upon the world. I believe this. People have asked me, why don't you just retire? You've done enough. But I say, I can never do enough for Jesus. You say, why don't you go and sit on the beach? Well, I'm tempted to. But I want to tell you folks something. The Lord is coming. And the question is, are you ready? Now we come to the third part of this talk. The end times survived. How to survive the great tribulation. And I say it absolutely emphatically on the basis of the teachings of Jesus. You will be here. I'm going to prove it to you. I don't want to annoy or upset my dear friends who believe that the rapture takes place and all the saints of God are raptured home to glory. I don't believe that because I don't believe it's taught in the Bible. I believe it's a very popular idea. I believe it's a very, very comforting idea. But Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, no one would survive it. But he says, for the sake of the elect, those days are going to be shortened. Therefore, Jesus said that the elect are going to be right here when the tribulation comes. I'm going to try to prove this to you, and I think I can prove it to you. I want you to come now to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. I'm going to show you some stuff and ask you just to think about it. Don't just get mad with me without a good reason. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. I want you, please, just go and check it out in the Scriptures. Would you please indulge me? Revelation 7 verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude. I want you to put these thoughts in your head. A great multitude which no one could number. Of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. God's got a big family. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Listen, let me just try to get these truths out there today. In the last days, God is going to have a great multitude of people saved. And the Bible says this great multitude is composed of people from every nation on the face of the earth. Just want you to, to hear this and to believe it. Listen to me. In the Old Testament, the focus was the Jewish people, God's chosen nation. I'm going to say something now which is going to antagonize the rest of you <laughs> who haven't been antagonized and turned off so far. Here it is. In the Old Testament, the focus was the Jewish people, God's chosen nation. But I'm here to tell you today that God no longer has a chosen nation. He's got his people in every nation. Now listen. In the New Testament, the focus is on people from every nation, Jews and Gentiles. Many miss this truth and are trapped in racism. They say, no, you got to go to such and such a country. That's where God's chosen people are. No. That's an insidious form of racism. God no longer has a special nation. God has special people in every nation. Now, this is what the Bible teaches. Now, I want to show you something. I want you to come over here to Romans chapter 9 and verse 8. Dear hearts and gentle people, Romans chapter 9 and verse 8. Romans chapter 9, and I want you to notice it in verse 8. This is the great Jewish scholar Paul talking. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Hey? That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Your nationality doesn't count anymore. As far as God is concerned. And it says, the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people were the special nation. They were the fleshly descendants of Abraham. 
and the rest were cast out, sort of. They were Gentiles. But Paul, the greatest Jewish scholar, apart from our our Lord, who has ever lived, said, the children of the flesh, they are not the people of God, but the children of the promise accounted for the seed. So if you believe in Jesus, he's the promise. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, you're counted for the seed. So it's not the flesh, it's the spirit. Who said it? Paul said it. The Bible says, we read the text, there's going to be a great multitude saved in the last days. People from Los Angeles. That shows you there are miracles. People, <laughs> people, and I've worked there for many, many years. People from Los and I've met some great saints in Los Angeles. <laughs> people from Los Angeles. New York. Chicago, Moscow, London, Sydney, Beijing, San Salvador, San Francisco, Mexico City, Havana, and every other city, town, village on the face of the earth. God doesn't have a nation. He's got his people in every nation. In America, in Australia, in Canada, in Great Britain, in Brazil, in Israel, in Germany, Spain, Russia, Ukraine, and your nation. It's not your nationality. White people, brown people, black people, God's remnant people. Now come back to Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Don't get mad with me because I'm teaching the Bible. Some people say, this is not what I'm taught in church. Well, I really don't care. I want to go and see what the Bible teaches. But Revelation chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. Revelation 7 and verse 13 and 14. So here we have, we've been talking about the great multitude of every nation. Verse 13 and 14. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? Where did this great multitude come from? This is the question. Here's a picture of this great multitude. They're Gentiles and Jews and Calathumpians and Russians and Americans and Australians and Chileans, uh, every person who trusts in Christ. You hear what I'm saying? If you don't trust in Christ and follow his word, you are not a child of God. And if you believe the Bible, you can never, ever be a racist and think that because of the color of your skin, you're better than other people. You know, that's a, the that's a lie of the devil. People say, but, but Jesus, I've heard people say this to me, but Jesus was an Englishman. <gasps> Jesus was an Englishman? Yeah, well, in all the pictures, he looks as English as... English can be. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus came from Palestine. Jesus was the brother to the Arab. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, 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 yes. You know, we're drowning today in a sea of ignorance, I'm afraid to say. Look at Revelation 7. I hope you're not one of them. <laughs> Uh, Revel- no, of course you're not. Revelation 7, thir- uh, 7, 13 and 14. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? This great multitude. And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. The people who are saved, who survived the uh, the great time of trouble, the great tribulation. These people who are made up of people from every nation. It says, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. Hey, how could they have come out of the great tribulation if they'd been raptured home to glory? Anybody ever think about that before? Oh, 
But my pastor, I don't care. My authority is not the church, not some TV evangelist. My authority is it is written. The word of God, my friend. Now here is the secret to their salvation. They're in Christ. They came out of the great tribulation. You can't come out of something if you're not already in it. Come on, let's think this through. I asked Paul the prisoner the secret of his endurance. He said, I clung to Christ. I recall the words of scripture that I'd studied and memorized. What about you? You Memorize scripture? Or are you a conformist? Whitewashed? Brainwashed? He said, I refuse to give up hope. I prayed for my enemies. I'm going to quote a great statement from... uh, a great book written here in America many years ago called The Great Controversy. Many people read it, many people don't follow it because it's inconvenient. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as a standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. That's why I say to you in these meetings, sola scriptura. Don't say to me the church says. I don't follow the Pope either the one in Rome or your own personal one. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent the voice of the majority. Not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith before accepting any doctrine or precept we should demand a plain thus saith the lord in its support satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention uh, to man in the place of god he leads the people to look to bishops to pastors to professors of theology as their guides instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves think for yourself Then by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the multitudes according to his will. And you know it's true. I want you to notice this text, Revelation 12 and 11. Revelation 12 and verse 11. Come on, let's have the text. Revelation chapter 12, 11. And they overcame him, the saints in the last days. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death, they overcame through the blood of the Lamb. They knew Christ. They weren't conformists. They weren't wimps. They weren't deluded. They weren't simple-minded. Christ is the Lamb of God. It was Pastor Murgar, a great friend of mine in Kiev, Ukraine, Five years thrown into a hell hole in prison. Here's a picture of Pastor and Mrs. Murgo with Beverly and me. He was told, just inform, and we'll let you out. He said, never, never, never. Stubborn. Good to be stubborn for God. Don't be a wimp. I said, what gave you strength? He said, faith in Jesus, faith in his redemption, faith in his love and grace. I had a personal faith in Jesus. I studied the scriptures. That's how he overcame his time of trouble. Pastor Kulikov, the church in Russia, sent to Siberia, five years in the forest and mines of Siberia because he was a Christian. Most Christians today are too lazy to get out of bed and go to church. What are they going to say when they meet these people, if they ever do? Cold, hungry, he would not surrender. Why, Pastor Murga? Faith in Jesus. I held on to Jesus. I had God's word in my heart. Now read it again. Revelation 7 and verse 9. Revelation 7 and verse 9. Here is the text. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribe, people and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes having palm branches in their hands. Their home in glory. It's a great multitude made up of every nation. And Revelation 7, 13 and 14, 
Look at this because I guarantee you've never read it or thought it through. Revelation 7. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. You can't come out of it unless you're in it. And washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's how you survive it, by being a nonconformist for Jesus. Not by being a wimp, but by being a man or a woman of God. And my appeal is very simple today. Believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Believe in Jesus. And read and study the word for yourself. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and for his glory, Amen and amen. The Antichrist is in the temple of God. I will read you the actual words of the great Roman Catholic Church. More than a billion people pray to the dead. But the Bible talks very plainly about good angels and bad angels. Why on earth were you and I born? This DVD series from John Carter will be yours with a gift of $50 US or $70 Australian. Write to us at the address on the screen. Visit carterreport.org, your home for inspirational teaching. It takes only a minute to have eternal life. How can you get saved in a minute? It's simple. First, believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Second, accept his free gift of eternal life. And then, you're saved. It's not hard. It doesn't take any time. You can be saved in a minute right now. Pray with me. Lord God, I realize that I am a sinner. My sin has separated me from you. I accept that your Son, Jesus Christ, died for me. I ask Jesus into my heart. If you prayed this prayer, you are saved. The next thing to do is tell someone. Fellowship with other followers of Jesus. Get baptized. Read your Bible and pray. Choices. We make them every day, all day. The most important choice you will make in your life is whether to choose eternal life or let it pass you by. If you'd like more information about your new life, call the number and visit our website. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.